Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you all for coming. Um, okay. Uh, I'm Taylor Bitton. I am the youth leader of the Mission View Activities Committee, and I am just so grateful to have been able to have been given the opportunity to plan this event and work with the Jewish Family Services and Mission View Activities Committee, and of course, Sam Silberberg, who you're all here to see speak tonight. Um, because as we all know, this topic is just become increasingly important with the few number of Holocaust survivors left. And again, I really appreciate all of you coming here tonight to hear him speak and help the message of the Holocaust live on because it is just so important. Um, Sam is going to speak in for the next 45 minutes. And then there will be a question and answer session with some of the questions that you guys submitted out there. Afterwards, there will be an optional book signing with Sam's book, From Hell to the Promised Land. And um, that will just be right up front up here afterwards. Um, so yes, yeah, Sam's speech is going to be 45 minutes, but that is just not enough time to tell his entire story, his years of struggle and pain. So please feel free to ask him questions afterward and read his book for more detail because he has so much more wisdom to share that he just doesn't have time for right now. But without further ado, here is Sam Silberberg. Hi, how is everyone tonight? I hope you're ready for a, a really dynamic person. Uh, Sam, uh, as Taylor has said, is a Holocaust survivor born in Poland. He's 92 years old, and he really has a passion to make sure everyone understands and knows the importance of learning why we can never do this again and why, why they say they'll never forget. So I'm gonna let Sam start. Okay. I was in 1938, I was nine years old when my grandfather left Poland to go to the Holy Land. And we had a bon voyage party and there was in my small town in Poland, which was only 12 miles out of Auschwitz, by the way. Everybody gathered, and as a kid, because of various anti-Semitic incidents in school, I was quite sensitive to what the adults are talking about and saying. I see a bunch of people standing at that Bon Voyage party, a bunch of guys, Hasidic Jews, by the way, and they were murmuring and talking about something. And I was really curious to find out what's going on. And an uncle of mine saw me nosing around to find out what's going on. So he told me, you know what they're talking about? They're talking about the Kristallnacht, which is the night of broken glass when Nazi goons attacked German Jews and killed some and destroyed synagogues. And by that time, the Nazi laws prohibiting Jews from doing business or going to school was instituted in, in Germany for quite some time before that. And they told me about it. And he told me, you know, you can feel the clouds of war coming because the Germans went into Sudetenland, which is part of Czechoslovakia, and annexed it under the pretext that it is the German-speaking people, so they are entitled to occupy it and annex, annex that part of Czechoslovakia to Germany. And you are now witnessing similar behavior with another authoritarian dictator, Vladimir Putin in Russia, and now you know what's going on. Well, as a kid, when my uncle saw me, 
nosing around to find out what's going on, what is, why are they so perturbed? He took me aside, he said, do you know what happened? He told me exactly what happened in Kristallnacht. And he said, before you know it, the Germans are not going to be satisfied with taking part of Czechoslovakia. They're going to take part, they're going to keep on. And that's exactly what Putin did this time. He wasn't satisfied with Crimea that he took in 2014. So he decided to occupy Ukraine. But the Holocaust was a total different thing. Because as he said this, he told me, you know what? You have been subjected to anti-Semitism and you know the persecutions that are taking place in Germany and if God forbid it comes to Poland, the same thing may happen. But sure enough, right after my 10th year birthday, my birthday, which is August 25th, on September 1st, 1939, the Germans marched into Poland. And they marched in with such bravado, and they were singing, Heute gehört uns Deutschland, morgen die ganze Welt, which means today we own Germany, tomorrow the whole, the entire world. And with that attitude, they walked in and they took hostages, primarily Jewish hostages. They're in case that somebody attacks Germans, so they will shoot them as a warning sign. Sure enough, they executed and shot two uncles of mine in adjacent towns. And they also took my father hostage, so in case something happens in our town. So we, my fa our family got very worried about it. We had different businesses, a printing plan we also had shares in a bus corporation, and so on. And my mother was totally distraught. And by the way, I had two brothers and a sister. And we were very sad by the fact and worried about him being imprisoned. And they called all financial help from the family to bribe some Germans so that they can release my father. When he was released, he was totally unrecognizable because they cut his beard off, they shaved it, they did this, that and the other. But thank God that he released them. Now, the Germans kept, issued orders, kept prohibiting Jewish kids from going to school. They kept confiscating Jewish businesses, but since they didn't have anyone to manage those businesses, they forced my father to manage the business while at a very meager salary which would hardly support to have food for the kids and so on. But they forced them to manage the business and the Germans made sure that the books are kept so that they can control everything. It was awful. 
Well, and the great punishment that they gave us in case we didn't do it would be to be executed. And they have executed members of different of our town for different reasons. We were very worried and afraid. Nevertheless, they prohibited us from going to school. So because our family cherished and primarily the Jewish community as a whole cherished education and learning. And my, my day before this was spent by going to public school in the morning and then to Heide or Hebrew school in the afternoon. I had very little time to play and enjoy stuff. And it was an awful way to live because we didn't know what the next day is going to bring. Every day, every few days, they announced on the town sites, there was no website at that time, as you know. <laughs> there was only a horse and buggy town in Poland, not like in the USA. So, but they announced that we cannot go to school and we cannot do anything. We cannot purchase any groceries. Everything was prohibited, especially for the Jews. And there was a vast difference the way they allocated the races for the Jewish community as opposed to the Polish community surrounding us. Things were getting worse from month or week to week because, and month to month, because the Germans had assembled the young, able-bodied men in town and sent them to concentration camps, to labor camps, because they, the Germans, had mobilized all their youth and able-bodied men to partake in a war of occupying the world like they had decided to do. But incrementally, they, they just picked people and showed their might by shooting them and executing them in public. It was an awful sight. And soon enough, we learned that we cannot go to school, we cannot go to Hebrew school, nothing, everything. We were prevented from our education. And lo and behold, every few weeks, they organized raids in which they took able-bodied men to German labor camps to keep the German industry going. And as you know, in 1939, they occupied Poland. Within three days, they marched through Poland like a knife through Mara. And soon enough, they occupied the rest of Europe and decided 
to go and take the able-bodied people into the German labor camps and the weak and so they decided it to execute it and they maintained a strict card, a strict list of people that they want to make sure that they had keep the industry going. And they had, so they had taken in one of the raids, they had taken my brother, my older brother, to a German labor camp. So when that happened, my father instructed me to be in charge of taking the kids because the Jewish community maintained learning institutions in private homes for the different classes. So since my sister was younger by a year and a half and my other brother was younger by four years, so my father told me that it's my responsibility to take them to the different homes and where they can get instruction and they will be taught all the things that they were, would have been taught in school. And as I was doing it, I had to be very careful to make sure that we do not get caught by the Germans when they make their raids. Because when the Germans made their raids to, to fill their quota for the labor camp, they also took the kids and others and took them to an extermina extermination camp. There were not, in the beginning, there were no extermination camps, but what they would do is make the people dig trenches and have them stand over the trench and shoot them so they fall into the trench. That's how life was during the beginning of the German occupation. Things got worse as time went on because they occupied other countries and they decided that shooting and killing people and making graves is not an efficient way of conducting business. So they decided to do an extermination camp like Auschwitz, in which they take gas, built gas chambers. And actually what they did was telling people that they are going to a better place. And while they did that, they took him to Auschwitz, where they had him undressed and supposedly go to take showers to be cleansed. And in, while the showers were going on, they had on top of the showers, they had Cyclone B-12, which is a gas, and thereby exterminating people and then burning them in the crematorials of Auschwitz. Auschwitz was built originally as a Polish officer's facility. 
But as they occupied the west of Europe, they built that special railroad to Birkenau, which was adjacent to Auschwitz, on top of which was a tower where the Germans kept the immaculate records of all the trains that went from throughout occupied Europe, as you know, that they eventually broke their agreement with the Russians and came right through the Ukraine which you hear about these days, into the Battle of Stalingrad, which you've probably heard about. It was, and what they did is gather all the people, put them into freight trains all the way from Hungary, all the countries, Ukraine, all the countries they occupied. And the only countries where they weren't able to kill and execute the Jews or make a difference because they made the Jews wear the Star of David, the Yellow Star of David, to differentiate. The only Scandinavian countries were notable for not allowing the Jews, the Germans to take the Jews or differentiate between the Jewish community and non-Jewish community because when they issued the edict that all the Jews have to wear the yellow star of David, all the Swedes wore this, all the Norwegians wore the star of David so that they could not make a difference or take the Jewish people and execute them. But the West, of Europe was not as cooperative with the Jewish people, and they were quite anti-Semitic and cooperated with the Germans, especially the Polish population was extremely cooperative with the Germans. As a matter of fact, even Nowadays, the Polish government, which is headed by Mr. Duda, has issued a verdict that the survivors of the Holocaust are not entitled, are not allowed to claim the properties of their of their forefathers and so on. So Poland was very anti-Semitic at that time, and still is. Sam, can you tell us, um, when you were taken to the camp, can you tell us a little more detail about when you were taken to the camp with your father? Well, after my brother was taken to camp, the Germans issued edicts and actually resettled, forced Jews into ghetto, where a ghetto is a limited area, a geographic area, where they concentrate the Jews. So they took the Jews from small towns all into a ghetto, in order to facilitate their collecting a labor force 
and also the indigent to be executed and uh, exterminated in Auschwitz. So when all this happened, they decided to make our town, which is actually about 12 miles out of Auschwitz into another town. In all the surrounding small towns, they gathered the Jews into a ghetto, as I told you, to facilitate them, them collecting able-minded men to work while the meek and elderly people and children, they collected to go to Auschwitz. I had many, many ways that I could just escape from the German collecting the Jews. I learned that it's like when you consider the way they did it to facilitate the attacking people and get us, they rationed food and they were smart enough to institute Jewish management with Jewish police system without weapons, but they are the ones that were subservient to the German occupation and institute the commands that the Germans told them to do. So in the ghetto, so we were taken away from a small town into a huge ghetto where there were 35,000 Jews, and we had a small apartment on the bottom floor, the cellar, it was a hill, and my father and my mother decided that since we didn't have any means of supporting they still forced my father to go and run the business in the adjacent town from which we were taken so that he runs the business for them. But he had, there were, he had no means of really supporting the family. And the conditions in the ghetto were so awful that people were starving from hunger and we couldn't get out of the ghetto. So it came to a point where he told me, look, you, I know you're only 11 and a half years old, but the situation is such that we cannot afford to live and feed the family so, and since there is such a shortage of goods and materials, both inside the ghetto and outside the ghetto, outside the ghetto, the agrarian Polish community had food stuff, that cows, that the livestock. So they they had a lot of food. The ghetto was stricken with shortages of food and people were dying because of it. So he decided, you know what? You go out and take goods that are manufactured in the ghetto like shoes and uniforms or clothing 
to the agrarian community, which was limited in those articles. I had no idea how to do commerce or do it. And I was not allowed to go on the tram, the electric tram that connected the various places. So I didn't know. So he told me, look, in the ghetto, there's, they manufacture shoes that they're craftsmen and clothing. So you buy a suit for 25 bucks and sell it for 35 outside. And you buy shoes for 10, sell it for 12 and so on. I had no idea the 11 and a half how to do it. Besides, I was scared a little bit of risking my life to go in the tram, with the tramway, streetcar. It's not a streetcar named Desire. It's a streetcar that was collecting, that people used, and Jews were prohibited from using. So when he told me to go there and use it, and I went on the streetcar, I was literally shivering because I was afraid that the Polish passengers would detect me and hand me over to the Nazis. But slowly I learned the trick and I was able to bring goods from the outside world to the ghetto and vice versa. It was a very, very difficult way to do it, but I really liked it after I got the hang of it. <laughs> and I was able to do it. As a matter of fact, when I bought, I was on the way once with food supplies and stuff that I bought on the outside world. A Nazi guard yelled at me, stop, halt. So I realized, I was afraid, and I realized, so I started running with the goods because I didn't want to lose the goods. However, I took out a bottle of booze that I had among the goods and I dropped it on the floor. Sure enough, he stopped to pick up the bottle. And while he did this, I was able to get into the ghetto without being caught and taken to the Auschwitz extermination camp. Things were going from bad to worse because luckily we had this apartment on the basement floor and it was on top, it was on, on the bottom of a hill that could oversee the, the valley where the electric, the, the street cars were going, which the Jews were prohibited from using. So do you want to talk about your tattoo and, and um, being in Auschwitz, being in the concentration camp? And well, the, my father built a hideout. He walled off a room in which we were hiding out because we could see from the, the basement the, the apartment we were in in the little yard the Germans coming and, and collecting the Jews well sure enough when, about 1943 beginning of 1943 all of a sudden we, we saw a whole convoy 
of German cars and motorcycles surrounding the ghetto. And so we went into the, the hiding place against that wall. He built a, he had a stove with a baking compartment. And the baking compartment was used as an ent mean of entering into the hiding place. Well, we, because we were on the very bottom floor, we heard the German trucks moving above us, and then we could hear the announcement saying, all Jews, all of you must go to the big place and record the for immigration purposes. That was their excuse. We heard this, we heard the truck moving. And at that time in the hideout, we were about 18 people. It was built normally for 14 people, for different family members and members that lived there. But at this particular time, there were 18 people in the hideout and we could hear the tracks. And all of a sudden, we hear footsteps in the apartments above us, the German soldiers, and you could hear how they ran and all this. And we were very quiet to make sure we are not detected. But among us was a mother with a young baby. And the baby started crying. So the mother took a pillow to, to subdue the baby's cries. And it was of no help because the Germans heard the cries and decided, took access to open the floor from, from above us and ordered us to go and report to the, to the assembly place. Now remember, there were 35,000 Jews in that ghetto. At that point, my father was with my mother and myself and my younger brother. My sister was in a hospital which had, because she had gangrene in her leg and they were going to amputate it. And so as they announced we should go, we all went to the assembly place and it was such mayhem. The cries in the place, because the Germans separated mothers from their babies and fathers from their family. It was an awful sight. The crying, it was unbelievable. And when I read, they were roped off sections where the people, where the Germans made the segregation to, to take people to the labor camp and people destined to go to the extermination camp. So when I saw that, and then that I was about 13 and a few months old at that time. That's a hell of a place to have a bar mitzvah. <laughs> but as I saw this, I figured I am going to be uh, very, very dangerous to my father because if they see me with my father, I am going to be the one that will prevent them to go to a, to a labor camp. So I told my father, look, you go and, and you get selected. I'll take care of myself. 
I didn't know what to do. I waited. So when my father was led by the Germans to go to the labor camp, I saw the German guard tackling a family where the, where the kids started crying and so on. And I took the opportunity of this time to sneak into the section where my father was to go to the labor camp. I was able to do this, but then I realized there's a secondary inspection of a German officer with a whip and so on coming up. So I said, what do I do now? Because when you see me, I'm that small, he's going to send me to the extermination camp. Fortunately, I was, there was a construction site right there. I was able to take a center block, stand on it in the back row. So when the, he, the German officer came and asked my father, what are you doing? What is your profession? He said, I am a builder. In German, he said, I'm a mauer, which is the same thing. And so he pointed him to go to the people, selected able-bodied men to the labor camp. After, then he goes in the back and says to me, what are you doing? So I said, I am a builder's helper. <laughs> so he also told me to go to the labor camp. Of course, he didn't see me standing on a cinder block. <laughs> so I had to wait till he went a few rows down. And I went with my father. They loaded us up on trucks. And as we were on top of the truck, I could see what's going on and how could hear the cries. It was a sound of hell. There was people, kids were taken away from the mother's breast and dumped on the sidewalk. It was an awful sight. And I thought, uh, being on the truck, that I'd be able to see my mother, but I wasn't able to see in that crowd, anything. So I got, I got into, with my father, I talked to him, and he said, just stay quiet, do what they tell you to do, and so on. And of course, the truck moved away. We were taken to a labor camp in Anna, called Annaberg, and there we built barracks for future inmates and so on. After three months or so, when we finished the barracks that we were building, the Germans decided to transport us to a labor camp called Blechamer. But bear in mind, that I, as a kid, I was a rambunctious kid. I could not stand the being surrounded by barbed wire. And my father warned me, whatever you do, don't dare escape because these barbed wire are electrified. Well, as they took us to Auschwitz, which was a labor camp near an industrial complex. And in that labor camp, there were a lot more prisoners. As a matter of fact, there were about 40, 4,800, 4,800 prisoners in that labor, labor camp. It was called Annaberg. It was a subcamp of Auschwitz. We were issued striped uniforms. Of course, I was too small. I had to fold everything up, so you see. And we were folded in that camp. And in that camp, we were issued numbers. My father's number was 
178508 508, which means 178508. And my number was 108, 178509, which is 178509. As a matter of fact, just yesterday, I got a, a gift for my hiking partner, Alexander Quijano, who's an artist, commemorating my number. And this is the gift that I got. It was, I was very, very touched by it because most people like to erase the number that they don't want to have any remnants of what has transpired. But I figured I never erased it because if you erase it, you only do something superficial in your heart. You know what you went through. Sam, we've now run out of time. We're, we've run out then, of time to talk. Then you can ask questions because... <laughs> There's a lot. Okay. You can ask questions because okay. after this, there's a lot of stuff that happened. I had a book. I published a book of my memories. As a matter of fact, I went back to Poland in 2002 with a friend of mine and went back so to make sure that the book is authentic and visited all these places. And if you wish to know the entire story, you can purchase the book. It's called From Hell to the Promised Land for 15 bucks. Okay. So Taylor has some questions that different people have come up with, if you could answer. You have so, to tell me. so Taylor has questions. Yeah, that she's been given to ask you. So I think she's going to ask, read some of the questions. Do you want to take a quick sip of water? Well, I'm asking Nothing. the question. You can have some water. Um, did you ever get help from a German during the war? Did you ever get help? What was it? From a German during the war or any outsiders? Did you ever get any help from any of the outsiders or any Germans during the war? Was there anyone that helped you? Actually, the only help I had and I was fortunate because in Brahma concentration camp, I went to the industrial complex where I was working, helping a welder. That welder was limping because he was a German who was in, injured on the Russian front. And he was very good. There were days, it actually ties into a story which I must tell you. <laughs> I had discussions with my father and I was very, very, very disillusioned with life because when I see so all these people dying, and, and the only way you could escape it if you were on the industrial complex and the Allied forces came to bombard and a bombardment took place so that there wouldn't be a repercussion because if somebody escapes, they would take 10 prisoners and execute them. As a matter of fact, there was an air raid once where the Allied planes came by and I managed to escape from the dust complex. But lo and behold, they didn't drop any bombs. So actually, at the age of 14, I was left in a dilemma. What do I do? 
Now, sure enough, I had to decide. I decided to come back because otherwise my father and nine others will be executed. So Sam, I believe she has some more questions for you. Yes, and that man, the welder that helped you, that story is in his book, it goes further into how that man actually helped him reunite with his mother too after the war. So that's all in the book as well. Um, and that question was from Emily, by the way. The next question is from Angel P. And it is, did your faith ever waver during your time in the Holocaust? Did your faith ever waver during the time you were going through all of this? Well, my faith did waver because I had a discussion. I can imagine 14 year old you're in a concentration camp and the German soldiers had at the battle the assassin's signature with the inscription, God is with us, which means God is with us. And my father was an Orthodox Jew. He prayed and he tried to maintain his kosher tradition in camp, which was, and I argued with him about it. You can imagine being, being in concentration camp and arguing with your father about it. And he said to me, look, you, and I was very disillusioned because I saw people dying. I said, why don't I just commit suicide? And that's it, forget about it, there's no point. So he told me, listen, Sam, you gotta have faith. Believe in God and God will help you. Well, he said, look, I tell you the story about two flies. One of them was a believer, and the other a non-believer, but the new don't want to take religious reasons for it. I'll give you a better example. One of them was an optimist. The other one was a pessimist. Both flies fell into green. The pessimist had no self-faith, had no hope. He just let go of the wings and drowned in the green. The optimist had faith in its ability to get out and manage and kept flapping the wings back and forth until he made Barra out of the queen and got out. So let that be you listen. It's always better to be an optimist than a pessimist. I believe Taylor has more questions for you. Yes, here's another one. Um, throughout your time in the concentration camps and the death march, what would you say the hardest moment was for you? What was the hardest moment for you when you were in the concentration camp or on the death march? The, hard, <clears throat> the hardest moment for me was on February, on January 26th, when they evacuated the camp to go into deeper Germany. And I want you to know there were 4,800 people that were taken on the road and by foot, which is known in the annals of history as the Death March, only 800 of the 4,800 4, reached the destination. 80% of the people perished. And it was during that, during that death march that, that I escaped, which is very involved. Again, I recommend if you are interested to, for you to get the book. It was, the hardest thing was to witness the pain. As a matter of fact, one of the proudest things of my life, look, 
at 92 years old. I made money, I lost money, I don't care. But the one thing this is to me a test of character was during the death march on the fourth day of the death march we were starving and a German peasant threw a bucket of rooting potatoes that he made cooked for the pigs and of course all the prisoners jumped on it. I remember catching one small potato like this and I it, it haunts me till today because I know that I hesitated whether I should share this little potato with my father and I thank God that I had this sense and strength of character despite the starvation to share this little potato with my father but I still have the guilt that I had doubt but those were the circumstances we lived in. And then before we close off, what is one, uh, so a word of advice or message that you would give since there are a lot of kids in the audience, something they can do to prevent this in the future? So what advice, what, what is your thought today that you would want to express to everyone here about the future and how, what, how this has impacted you? So is there something that you would like to say as far as advice or thought? First of all, I realized and I was finally convinced that to be an optimist, you got a hell of a better chance <laughs> to succeed and be sure of yourself and make, and make it. But I want you to know that I escaped from the death march to my mother who was in a Catholic convent in Germany working as a non-Jew. And that's how I survived the war. And subsequently went with a youth, with a youth organization to Palestine, which was then a, a British mandate and I was taken by the British with the other youth to Cyprus where I was interned for eight months and I was sworn into Haganah, which is the Israeli Defense Forces and fought in the war the, and I had the greatest honor to fight for the, the for the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Okay, thank you so much, Sam. Um, we are now going to be closing it off since it is seven. And um, again, there is the opportunity to buy Sam's book, From Hell to, Pro to the Promised Land. And um, let's please all give a very big round of applause for Sam Sigurdard. <laughs>